The Limit of God's Patience 2 Peter 3, 9-10 reads, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Anyone who knows the fierceness of God's wrath will never take his patience for granted. That was why Paul said that they know the terror of God. Therefore, they persuade people everywhere to repent. That is, while mercy lasts, we must find forgiveness. God will never bring judgment upon any man until he has given him several opportunities to repent and he refuses to change. The patience of God does not in any way imply weakness. We must be careful not to take divine patience for granted because the patience of God has boundaries and limits. It is very true that the God we serve is a merciful one. However, that description of God is not balanced. Yes, God is patient, but that is not all about Him. There is no way God's judgment will come upon a person that he or she will not be guilty of. The same God we know to be merciful is also a consuming fire, and the merciful God that is presented to us has another dimension, which is judgmental. Do you know that the same Jesus who came as the Lamb of God and took away the sins of the world during his earthly ministry is the same one who will return as the judge of the world? So, he came first of all as a savior and a lamb, but he will return as a judge and a lion. It is very hard to imagine the contrast between a lion and a lamb. However, Jesus has both characteristics. God is not weak in fulfilling the prophecy of the return of the Lord. He is only exercising long-suffering so that people would come to salvation. God wants people to be saved, more than we do, at the fullness of time, the patience of God will elapse. History has it that Noah preached for about 120 years before the flood came. God had patience with the inhabitants of earth, but at the fullness of time, the unexpected rain came. The Generation of Noah Genesis 6 verse 13 and 14 And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. The generation of Noah teaches us that a nation or a set of people can jointly choose to incur God's wrath, just the same way an individual can provoke God's wrath. God had told Noah about his plan to destroy the world, having seen the growing wickedness of humans on the surface of the earth. I have learned that God will never punish sinners without first of all making a route of escape for them. Noah preached righteousness for over a century and warned the people about the coming flood. But no one cared to listen to him. They mocked him because he was sounding senseless. Rain had never fallen in that generation, so a flood was unimaginable. It was hard for people to believe that there would be a flood. This is the same way people mock ministers of the gospel in our generation who preach about the rapture and the second advent of Christ. A lot of people find it hard to accept that there could be such a thing as rapture because it has never happened before. Except in the case of Enoch, such people fail to acknowledge that God is mysterious, that a thing that has never happened before does not mean it can never happen at all. The generation of Noah that disbelieved the possibility of a flood didn't stop the flood from taking them unaware. It came in a time they never expected. 
They had the opportunity to get into the ark and become safe from the flood. But they chose to turn deaf ears to the words of Noah. They could not blame God for being heartless. They only had themselves to blame for being unwise in their decisions because they all have the choice to get into the ark. And oh, the flood came. Imagine how they felt when they heard thunder roar and the lightning flash. And that first drop of rain came. They all thought of Noah as the floodgates of heaven poured. And as water began to pour out of the ground and they tried to swim as fast as they could, they climbed mountains trying to get to higher ground. The day the flood came, they were all caught unaware. This is the same way Christ will show up one day and people will be caught unaware. Those years it took before God finally vented his anger on the people. They would have taken him for granted and some would have made mockery of Noah. But when the time of patience elapses, it will be the turn of humans to beg God. Unfortunately, it may be too late to obtain mercy. Luke 17, 26 through 27 says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Luke 17, 28 through 29 reads, Likewise, also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The people of Sodom had committed their sins. They were so immoral, and they took laws into their hands, thinking there is no God or that He is too weak to execute judgment over them. To their surprise, fire and brimstone rained down when the patience of God for them had reached its limits. Unfortunately, it was too late for them to repent. It is very common for humans to make light of both people's and God's patience. They treat people who are extremely patient with contempt, and that they also do to God, to their disadvantage. And with the direction the world is going, don't you think the world is testing the patience of God? Proverbs 29.1 says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. If you don't want the judgment of God to come suddenly upon you, then you must not take his patience for granted. We even see people in today's church age taking God's patience for granted. We see an example of this in Acts 5. The second account of how Ananias and Sapphira tried to make a fool of God was recorded. You see, you can't outsmart God. It is ignorance for anyone to think he or she can get away with his or her sin. How can you use the brain that God gave you to deceive him? I mean, come on guys, God created your mind you can't outsmart him. But that is what Ananias and Sapphira tried to do. The couple had sold their land and tried to hold part of the money back before bringing the rest to the apostle Peter. It was not bad of them to have taken part of the money, but the problem they had was that they wanted to feed their self-ego by lying to have brought all the amount they sold the land. But they could not get away with their plan. The Lord exposed everything Will the one that created the eyes not see? Acts 5, 3 through 4 says, But Peter said, And Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. For Ananias and Sapphira, their level of lying had gone to a great extent that they were not only lying to themselves, they had the audacity to come and lie to the Holy Spirit. Although they were both asked separately, they lacked the fear of God, and they chose to lie even in the house of God. This is how many people behave in the Christendom today. 
If God is to deal with the present church like he dealt with the early church, I am sure many of us would not be here. The fact that God is showing you and I mercy does not mean that he now tolerates sin. Repent before it is too late. Sodom and Gomorrah 2 Peter 2 verse 4 to 6 For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. The spirit world knows what's coming. There are some subject matters in the Bible that should be taught, but not experienced, and this is one of them. But you will rarely find a sermon preached on the wrath of God. All we hear in today's pulpits is ten ways to be blessed, five steps to your breakthrough, six keys to be an overcomer. But rarely do you hear a sermon on the wrath of God. The wrath of God is something you want to learn about and not experience. There is no one that can stand the wrath of God. At the reality of God's wrath, even his angels quake before him.